Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome and hope you subscribe and hope you like this video as well. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for sticking around and I hope we have a good time here on this channel. So today is a very different video because we're going to talk about career. So I initially wanted to have a separate channel to talk about this and I think I would in the future, but since this was just the beginning, I wanted to talk about it here on this channel and hopefully as things pick up I'll be able to put them all on another channel. So just a little bit of background for some who don't know I'm a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist, I work in the hospital and I have been a pharmacist for a couple of years. I'm also an independent prescriber and I've also done a couple of courses after my pharmacy um, OSPAT program. I got my initial pharmacy degree from Nigeria and that was back in 2008 and then I moved to the UK in 2010 but just for my MSc and um, a couple of years later I looked into the overseas pharmacy assessment program um, because I wanted to be a UK pharmacist and I went through the whole process and here I am a couple of years later and that's why I want to talk about this topic because I always get questions usually from my friends or friends of friends in Nigeria wanting to know how to become a UK pharmacist and I thought this would be a good um, video to put out to them there just so they can watch it and obviously we can have conversations about what the process is. Before I go into the video I just wanted to say it's going to be a big topic I will not be able to talk about everything on here um, or in this video. Um, I would say I would speak more about the preparation to start the overseas pharmacy assessment program which is called OSPAP and so that's a process of you know getting your documentation and everything. I also need to mention that even though I'm going to be talking about it from an international perspective, so you being a pharmacist in your own home country and wanted to come to the UK, um, just mention that I didn't do that. I was already in the UK when I applied for the OSPA program, but there isn't much difference really. The only difference is obviously with a visa and I didn't need a visa um, for mine, but if you're coming from your home country, you would need a visa. And lastly, most of the examples or the reference points would be Nigeria because one, that's where I get most of the questions from and secondly, that's where I'm from. But obviously this video will be useful for anybody coming from any other country. Okay, so if you're watching this video, I'm sure you want to become a UK pharmacist or you're planning to do it or you know someone who's planning to do it. So congratulations for trying to take that step and I hope it works out all in your favour. The process I'm going to talk about will be mainly focused for people coming from non-EEA country. So there are three steps for becoming a UK pharmacist if you're coming from a non-EEA country. The first step is completing and passing the Overseas Pharmacy Assessment Programme, which is called OSPAP, and that's what we'll call it going on from this video because it's easier to say. The second stage is completing 52 weeks of pre-registration placement. It could be in a hospital, it could be in community pharmacy, GP practice, or um, any of the approved places, and it's for 52 weeks as I mentioned and you also need to meet and pass all the competences that comes with that um, placement and the last stage is passing the professional GBHC registration exam. So those are three um, stages. Now these three stages if everything goes well you'll be able to complete in two years which you know it might sound like a long time but honestly once you start the OSPA program it goes pretty fast and before you know it you're ready to be a UK pharmacist so don't be um, <laughs> disheartened when you hear it takes two years um, minimum it would go quickly and it would all be worth it so for this video I'm going to talk about the first stage and that's more about preparing for that first stage so preparing to complete or to enter into the OSPAP program so I have talked enough and I'm just going to delve right into it I have written a couple of things on a paper just so I don't forget. For you to get into the OSPA program, um, you need to apply first to the GPHC, that's a general pharmaceutical council of the UK. So you need to apply to them first. You can't just apply to the schools. You have to apply to the GPHC and they'll do something called an adjudication of looking at your qualification and degree and ensuring that you're eligible to apply for the OSPA program. And that's, it's only when you receive their eligibility letter that you can then apply to the universities to then complete the OSPA program. Now this process, the adjudication process, you would need a couple of documents. Now let's look at the documents. Before you do anything, I just have to say that you need to go on the GPAT website. I will link everything I talk about today in the down bar in the description box. After going on the website, the other thing I would say is you need to start this process 
early. So for example, if you wanted to commence the OSPA program in September of 2021, and I highly suggest starting now because at least one year in advance, because it would really help you because if there are any kind of delays or anything that happens in between, you'll be able to sort that out. Yes. The so first thing I personally think is what you need to do is look at the um, website and find out which documents you need to send by yourself. And we'll talk about that and the documents that need to be sent by other organizations and kind of have like a timeline just to ensure that they're all sent in good time. The first thing I did in my own time was to pass the English exam. So that was the IELTS. Some people call it IELTS, but I just call it IELTS. And it's the academic version that we um, that is used or accepted by the GPHC and most of the universities. Now, there's some countries that are exempt from it, but you need to check the GPHC website to find out um, if you are going to, if you meet the um, criteria to be exempted. But if you're from Nigeria and so many other countries, you probably would need to write that exam. So it's the academic version. There are two versions, the general and the academic. This is the academic version, which means that you need to um, score a minimum of seven in um, across it. So we have the reading, the writing, listening, and speaking. So those are the four things that, um, there are the four aspects that you need to pass and get a minimum of seven. What I would say is, make sure you kind of practice for it because a lot of people think, oh, it's just an English exam. I've been speaking English all my life. I don't really need to, you know, study for it. But you need to know what the structure of exam is, what to expect, because that's really important. But secondly, also to practice. I find that the writing part is the part some people fail. And it's not because they don't know how to write. It's just mainly because people are not used to writing. They are used to typing. So if you write and you have to practice with, I can't remember if it was a pen or pencil that you use, but you need to, you know, obviously stick to word count, how many words will fit in the line and, you know, those sort of things. So that's why you need to just kind of give it some time just so you can pass once and just move on with it. And another thing I would say is when you're filling the form for the ILTS, make sure you select um, or you add in the GPAT address just so they can send it, the results directly to them. And you don't want to have to send yours to them because... It just causes delays unnecessarily when they can just send it directly to the GPHC. Again, you need to check the website for the correct address. Um, whatever address you find on the website, I would have linked it, but I'm not going to link it only because it could change. Make sure you always put international applications on it just so um, it goes to the right department and prevents any kind of delays. Now, the IELTS exam is valid for two years. So once you take it, um, if anything happens and you don't get to do your OSPAP, at least it'll be valid for two years. So that's the first thing I would say you need to do. And whilst you're preparing for that, you can also do other things. You, The other document you need to send from your own self is your original degree certificate. Now, in this one, because um, I applied when I was in the UK, so it was easy to send it and the GPA to send it right back to you. So I don't know how it is doing it from Nigeria. I'm sure there would be a good method and GPA to send it right back to you. Um, but maybe you might want to do it through DHL, the GPA team needs to see it and they need to make a copy of it. Um, so that's something you need to do. And another thing which I didn't do in my own end, but I've checked on the website and it's a new thing. It's called the NARIC statement of comparability. And basically I think NARIC is called National Recognition Information Center. And what it does is that it assesses your qualification and issues a statement to see that it's comparable to a UK standard, which was different. I didn't do it on my own end, but in my own time rather, um, but it's something you're doing. Mind you, you have to pay a fee for this and you need to send the, um, I think it's a certified copy. No, you need to send the original version to the GPHC. So again, I don't know much about that because I didn't do it in my own time, um, but you need to um, do that. I think it's an online service, online service, and it seems um, straightforward. So you need to complete the form to do the application and pay for it. And then when they send you the result, then you can send the original one with your application um, to the GPHC. And now the final thing you need from yourself, because remember I said the documents you need to send and the documents that um, other organizations need to send. So those are two different things. Now the one that fourth document you need to send will be identification. And that is, um, there are a couple of things you need, your passport. And what I would say is 
for your IELTS, make sure that you use your passport as um, identification. It just makes things easier because if they use something else and you, it doesn't match, um, GPS will request some other things. So just try and use your passport for your IELTS just so when it's time for identification, it will be a straightforward process because you need to send a certified copy of your passport data page to the GPHC. And when it's when we say certified, it means that you need to take it to a solicitor, someone who's registered in your country, and they will um, certify with specific wording, which is on the GPHC form, that you know they know you and you know just a certification that they are used to doing. And you need to send that. You also need to send your certified copy of your birth certificate. And if you don't have one, there are statutory declarations for that, but they need to, you need to send a certified copy of that. And you need two passport photographs. Again, that has to be um, written at the back by your solicitor, or I think there are other people who can countersign it and there's specific wording as well for that, okay? And those are all the documents you need to send on your own end. Now, other documents organizations need to send and they need to send it directly from themselves is, let's see, there are quite a few of them. But the first one is your academic transcript. So I went to Unilag and the process was fairly straightforward. So you need to apply to a university and give them the address of where they need to send it to and GPT needs to receive your transcript. And it appears to be a straightforward process for many universities. So hopefully that will be good and easy and you can start working on it early just so it is sent on time. Another one you need is a letter of good standing. You need to get that from your pharmacist council in your own country. So ours was PCN, so Pharmacist, pharmacist, <laughs> pharmacist Council of Nigeria. And I had to get a letter of good standing. Ensure that if you can pay for DHL, just so you can track it, or at least it's trackable, and then you know when it arrives with the GPHC. Although I did have to mention that the GPHC are really, really good when it comes to updates. So if you want to know how many documents they've received so far, they would always tell you. They're very good with communication, like very, very good with that. So I recommend that. Now with your letter of good standing, ensure that it arrives to the GPT within three months of the date of issue. So that's one of the um, specifications that they've requested. So you need to do that in good time as well, okay? Another thing you need is your references. So you need one academic reference and that needs to be sent directly from whoever's doing it from the university. And the second one is a professional um, or yeah, a professional reference. So it has to be from your current or most recent employer. So they need to send that to the GPHC um, directly. If you're registered with any other organization, healthcare in your own country, they also need to send a letter of good standing. Now, once you have all these documents, so the ones that once I spoke about earlier that you send by yourself, you will put it in an envelope, obviously, <laughs> with the completed GPHC application form, which is on their website, and I'll link it down below. And you complete that. Either you can type into it or you can print it out and sign it by hand, but they need to receive a paper copy. So again, send it by registered mail just so you know when it has arrived. So in that, you put in um, obviously your certified copy of your passport, certified copy of your birth certificate, passport photographs, a completed form, obviously. And um, what else? If you have a UK NARIC theme, you need to put that in and your original degree certificate. So just put all that in and they'll send back what they want to. The fee for this um, process is £687 and it is non-refundable. So if GPT looks at your document and they think you're not eligible, um, they would not refund you that money. So it's something to bear in mind. Once, as far as I know, I don't know if this is still happening, the GPHC um, sit once a month and look at all the applications that they have. And once they look at it, then they would um, and they would, you know, decide which ones are eligible. And once they decide you're eligible, they will send you an email or a letter, usually both of them, to say you are. And that is such a big hurdle that you've crossed because once they do that, um, there's also um, once they do that, then you can apply to the schools. And sometimes the schools will um, invite you to apply. I forgot to also mention that in the form, there's a part that talks about um, universities um, preference form. So there are only like five universities that do the OSPAP. But again, that we'll talk about that in a different um, what's it called in a different video, talking about what universities and what to look out for. Okay, so those are the documents you need. And once they say you're eligible, then you can apply to the universities. 
and that would be it. I'll obviously hopefully get your um, unconditional offer where they would then issue you a confirmation of acceptance of study. I think after you've paid a certain amount of your fees and then you can then apply for your visa and you'll be ready to come for your um, OSPAP. So I'm going to leave the video at that for now. Uh, obviously, there's still other topics to explore. So, for example, I need to talk about OSPEP universities, you know, what to look out for when you're looking for universities, because you have to bear in mind the places that you're going to be living in, the cost of living there, do you know people there, and things like that, okay? I really hope you enjoyed and learned something from this video, and I will see you in my next video. If you do like this video, give it a thumbs up. I would leave... Um, all the links, as I said, in the down bar, just so you can. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.